following is a Battleground Virginia special report. The Democratic gubernatorial candidates. And now, your host, Leon Harris. Hello and welcome to our Battleground Virginia special. I'm Leon Harris. Three Democrats are vying for the chance to be their party's nominee in the gubernatorial election this November. But before either Brian Moran, Terry McAuliffe, or Creed Dees can take on the Republican nominee, Bob McDonald, they have to get past the June 9th primary. Over the next hour, we'll talk with the candidates to find out what they hope to bring to Virginia if they're elected the Commonwealth's 71st governor. And we're also giving Virginians a chance to ask the questions that affect their lives. We've teamed up with Politico, YouTube, and Google to bring your questions right to the candidates right here. We had questions submitted through YouTube and by text. We also got questions from people out in Virginia neighborhoods. So let's get started now with some of those questions. Politico's John Harris and I sat down with the Democratic candidates and here's what they had to say to our first viewer question. Hi, I'm Shannon. Um, I'm from Arlington, Virginia, and I just wanted to know how the new governor of Virginia would allocate more money towards our state public universities. You say more money needs to go it, to the it, university it's a system. Where would, you come, where would it come from? It's, come a, from? it's a priority for me. It, it, it's a matter of, of, in any budget, it's a matter of restating your priorities. You know, this, this higher education I plan I've got, it's going to be expensive. It's got about a $78 million price tag the first year. You know, I, I've been in the legislature for 18 years. We have about a $77 billion two-year budget. I'm confident that in, in somewhere in that budget, we can find $78 million to begin to reallocate as a priority higher education. We'll get this economy moving again and we will have additional state revenue. Colleges um, and higher education will be top of the list because uh, you know that is that serves as an economic engine at our wonderful colleges and universities. I also want to make sure that they are affordable to all uh, Virginians, regardless of income level. We do not do a good job here in Virginia of commercializing the patents. I, in my private life, have been involved in these projects. Maryland does a great job. So does North Carolina. Florida has just brought in, I think, six hundred million dollars. Basically, we have great research facilities. You bring in outside money. You then take that patent out to the public and commercialize. It could create hundreds of millions of dollars for us. Now let's turn to our Google moderator questions, all right? How do you plan to address the rift between Northern Virginia and the rest of Virginia and keep the state united? Uh, we are one commonwealth, truly. You know, just Saturday I was in Appomattox and Stanton and Harrisonburg. You know, people are worried about their jobs there. They're worried about home foreclosures. Uh, you know, we bring people together over common challenges, and I look forward to conquering those challenges. In Northern Virginia, we've had great economic growth, but the rest of the state hasn't seen it. That's why i got to focus on job creation in other parts of the state so that they have jobs there. We send a lot of tax dollars for areas that are, are depressed today. We need to build all of them up. We are one commonwealth. We can't act like what happens there doesn't affect us. We all got to work together. Virginia's never had a problem attracting jobs to Virginia, but the basic ba breakdown between the regions is that Virginia has failed to invest in the infrastructure to support economic growth. If you think about it, that, 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 that addresses the transportation problem between Northern Virginia and the rest of the state. What we need to do is invest in infrastructure, education, and transportation. That creates economic growth in all parts of the state. That will allow us to lift up the economies throughout the rest of Virginia, and that will equalize the funding formulas. Let's go to uh, Alexandria. This question coming in from the Google moderator. Reasonable people are not opposed to hunters having rifles and shotguns. What about handguns and assault weapons? Do you think our residents are safer if more people are armed? We strike a right balance here. We've got the laws on the books today. Enforce the laws, but part of enforcing those laws is to make sure we shut down this gun show loophole. I, if, if you go, you could be out there. One gentleman here who's a licensed dealer is selling firearms. You have to do the check in and fast. We have some of the best technology in the country. It takes 90 seconds. Next right here, no, no background check. That's crazy. Every single person here should have a background check. I support the Second Amendment, but my position on the Second Amendment on those issues isn't really that much different from Mark Warner and, and Tim Kaine. Um, I, I, I do not support the possession of, of assault weapons. Um, I, I don't. I, I own hunting rifles and a shotgun myself, um, but you know, I, I think it's going to take a guy like me from with the a reasonably strong Second Amendment background to bring people together to create consensus around ideas like closing the gun show loophole. I wrote the compromise on that legislation. I, I first I support the Second Amendment. I have a record of that in 13 years in the legislature hunting um, in, in Second Amendment. But this is an area in which particularly the, my friend uh, Creed Eads and I differ on guns. Um, 
I support one gun a month, restrictions on how many guns you can purchase in a month. Cree did not support that legislation. That was Doug Wilder's legislation, Governor Wilder's, to, to restrict it to one gun a month. He opposed that. Also, guns and bars. I do not believe alcohol and guns mix. I oppose guns and bars. He voted for it, and then when Governor Kane vetoed that legislation, he voted to overturn the governor's veto. Now, I was a prosecutor, and as I said, also a bartender. That does not mix. We should not allow those guns and bars. There are some places where guns do not belong. Courthouses, schools, bars. Um, and so let's take a reasonable approach uh, to the Second Amendment, and that's been my record in the legislature. Do you have a plan to help unemployed Virginians by bringing in new employment and business opportunities through alternative and renewable energy sources? Absolutely do. I mean, that, that's a big part of my plan. I, you know, the first job of the next governor is to restore confidence in the economy. I think the quickest way to create jobs, as I mentioned earlier, and, and to get the economy moving is to, develop, to invest in transportation, to develop a transportation solution. But, but frankly, the way we put Virginia on the cutting edge of job creation is by developing this energy technology economy. The next big thing is going to be alternative and renewable energy. You know, how we, how we respond to the energy questions that are out there are going to, going to be going to define to a large extent what our economy looks like for the next hundred years. Well, there's hundreds of thousands of jobs right now being created in America. And I want to get those jobs. I want to get us, but we're never going to get them until A, we offer some incentives and B, we have a mandatory renewable energy okay. standard. I, I truly believe the next revolution in jobs is green energy jobs. So I was the first in this campaign to come forward with requiring 25% of our energy come from clean, renewable energy sources. Because I know it won't happen without leadership. So I came out with a re mandate to say, you know, we have to invest in wind and solar and other alternatives that are clean. And I also know we will not achieve those green energy jobs if you continue to rely on 19th century solutions like coal and, and oil drilling. That's why I oppose offshore drilling. Uh, and I also oppose the new coal-fired power plant in the Chesapeake Bay. I'm the only candidate running for governor who does that. Each of the Democratic gubernatorial candidates will tell you they share the same goal, to make the lives of Virginians better. But the way that each man plans to reach that goal is different. Tonight, we will profile each candidate, starting with Terry McAuliffe. Scott Thuman has the story of a businessman and campaign fundraiser turned gubernatorial candidate. If it seems Terry McAuliffe is all smiles these days, it's because the campaign trail has been very good to him, especially considering what he's up against. The man best known as a mouthpiece for the Clintons and Barack Obama is now talking for himself and running for office for the first time. But the governor's seat? Well, he admits he likes to aim high. I'm going to shoot for that moon every single day, folks. McAuliffe's pitch, Virginia needs serious financial help, and his business and banking background is just what the doctor ordered. Hi, Peter Clint at the front desk. And Volunteer Linda Cernoff thinks so, too. He has a track record. He was the head of the Democratic National Committee. He has lots of contacts. Contacts like... And President Bill Clinton. Everybody knows that this guy raised a lot of money for me. What I want you to know is every nickel he raised, he also talked to me about how to be careful spending it. He will manage this government well. The former president wants to make sure that happens. What do you think of the crowd coming out for you today? It's great. I love it. I love it. I love being here. You help out Terry McCall quite a bit, it seems. Well, I hope. I think he really was made for this moment. It has its effects. I'm a diehard fan of him. Is that what brought you out today? Yes. He can make the case to Virginians that, look, I know this guy. I know a little something about creating jobs. And this guy has what it takes. He'll do that, they say, by pushing for wind farms on Virginia Beach and building a high-speed rail from D.C. to Richmond to Hampton Roads. He wants to shut down predatory loan companies and create a program to help nurses and teachers pay off student loans if they serve in high-need areas. But is this all just talk from someone who's a national name and not a Richmond regular? Supporters like to say he's another Mark Warner or Tim Kaine. I think Terry has the ability to shake things up. Terry McAuliffe is a powerful individual. He has a powerful voice. I think a lot of the other candidates who have been stuck in Virginia just have the Virginia perspective, and that can oftentimes be really limited. What might make him most attractive, though, they say, is what he could do later this year that the other candidates might not be able to, and that's use a big bank account and even bigger names to beat Republican Bob McDonald. 
Scott Thuman, Battleground, Virginia. Politico's John Harris and I sat down with Terry McAuliffe to talk about what he brings to Virginia politics. What is going to be your number one priority to fix the transportation problems in Virginia, and how are you going to pay for it? Yeah, uh, first thing we have to do, high-speed rail. Uh, President Obama has just committed over $9.3 billion, already allocated, ready to go. Ours would cost $1.3 billion, Union Station, Richmond, Hampton Roads. It would get a million one cars off the road. It would create 176,000 jobs. It would reduce emissions by 33,000 tons of CO2. We also, in that regard, also as it relates to the freight lines, we've got to be getting more of the double stack and going. We've got to get trucks off the road, get more of the cargo onto the freight lines. Those two things alone, I think, can help us tremendously. Where's the money going to come from? How do you pay for it? Well, high-speed rail, the federal government pays for that. That's already done. How do we do the other things as yes. it relates to transportation, on road construction, all that? I've said from the beginning of the campaign, we're going to have to have an honest discussion about revenue. We're going to have to bring everybody in a room, which I will do as governor. I also want to win the House of Delegates because mm -hmm. they stymied Governor Kane, Governor Warren, on transportation reform, bring everybody in a room and say, here's what we have to do. But I think I can be successful. Number one, the economy is in such bad shape, people are really paying attention to these economic issues. But number two, when they realize that we're going to be one of the few states in the country that no longer can have federal highway matching funds, when we have 26% of our roads and bridges are deficient, I have five young kids, I get in these roads and bridges, we've got to have an honest discussion about this. I will tackle that issue. I come from a business background. We need someone to come in and deal with it and quit kicking it down the road. Mr. McCall, uh, uh, Brian Rance says the time for the honest discussion is now and that he's being more honest honest than you are because at least he's put something concrete on the table, an increase in the sales tax. You say that's not a good idea in a down economy, but you don't give specificity to uh, Leon's question, how do you pay for it? What's the source? Oh, I'm sorry. No, what I have said, let's be consistent with what I have said. I have said I don't believe in raising people's taxes. Uh, how do we grow out of this economic problem where today we have to create new economic activity? I hate to see the budget cuts. I don't believe you raise people's individual taxes in a down economy. I've always said from the beginning of this campaign that we're going to, as it relates to transportation, that we're going to have to have an honest discussion on how we pay for it. I'll bring everybody in the room. Let's have a full discussion. Nothing should be off the table, and I will have a full discussion on how we have to pay for it. Is it fair to assume that some of these priorities, whether it's transportation or your plan to uh, uh, increase uh, teacher salaries to the national average right. or invest in the uh, in higher ed, that these things are not going to happen if the national economy doesn't improve? Absolutely not. What I have said, we've got to focus on job creation. No matter what's happening, jobs are moving around Tennessee and Arkansas just recently. Billions of dollars of investment from overseas countries to come in to build wind farms, wind blades, to build solar panels. That business is out there depending on the economy. We just haven't been successful because the House of Delegates won't give the governor the tools to go incentivize. The disposition of the detainees in Guantanamo Bay, as you know, is one of the thorniest national security yeah. and international relations issues that the country is facing right now. Mm -hmm. Now, you have said that you would not agree with having uh, detainees brought to Virginia. But I want to ask you something. If President Obama were to mm -hmm. call you personally, mm -hmm. if he personally asked you to reconsider, what would you tell him? Uh, here's what I've said. I've, I've not said that I wouldn't want him to come to Virginia. I have said, first of all, I don't think it's a smart idea that we should be inviting uh, mm -hmm. these alleged terrorists into Virginia. But I don't think we should be putting terrorists in the middle of population centers. In downtown Alexandria, near movie theaters, there are places that we can bring these terrorists, military bases. I just don't think we ought to be bringing alleged terrorists because with that, you're bringing a lot of attention and a lot of people around the world who might want to make a statement. I just don't think we ought to have that symbol in the middle of a population center. Brian Moran is the only candidate so far to come out and say publicly that he is going to work to repeal Virginia's 2006 constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, I think it was 2007. It's the Marshall Newman Amendment. Uh, I would say on this, first of all, in order to change it, Leon, you have to... Uh, it has to pass the General Assembly, you have to pass it twice, and then you have to have a referendum. So, Would you repeal it? Would you work to repeal that, am that amendment? It, it's not probably going to happen, as I say, 57% of the voters here in Virginia pass it. It is now part of our constitutional amendment. I have always been for civil unions. I'm for full contractual rights for everybody. But here's the issue. I am not going to be bogged down in governor dealing with issues that probably in the course of my four years may not be able to be changed. Uh, Governor Kane and, and uh, Governor Warner had issues with getting things done in the legislature. Right. 
and they've been in office. They've held statewide office, but they held other offices before. You have not had, held office of any kind. Yeah. How do you expect to be able to get anything through the legislature if, yeah. if Kane and Warner couldn't get it? Well, in fairness, Governor Warner had not held office before, so I just want to be clear on that exactly. fact. Exactly. Thank you. Um, listen, it's a new day. It is the worst economy since we've had since the Great Depression. It's a different time today. Now, I want to win the House of Delegates. That's why I'm running the largest grassroots people have seen in gubernatorial history. This weekend, Leon, we had over 5,000 people on the streets knocking on doors, making phone calls. The last six days, we made 217,000 phone calls. I have 14 offices. I have the largest grassroots mobilization. Why? Not only help Terry become governor, more importantly, I got to win that House of Delegates because there are a lot of big issues. We got more than 100 questions from Virginia residents on everything from gay marriage to transportation. Here now are two more tough questions from the people who will choose Virginia's next governor. VDOT seems determined to widen I-81. This would significantly impact air quality in the valley and the national park. What is your plan to get trucks off of I-81 and onto trains to maintain our quality of life and to combat global warming? I-81, it's a public safety issue. We've tried to address it with trucks and vehicles, uh, passenger vehicles on 81 by spot improvements, particularly on the on the elevations, mm -hmm. to try to get the trucks over into third lane, keep them out of the pass out of the passing left lane. Uh, ultimately, it is on a ultimately the answer is freight, and I want to promote that as governor and get that uh, get that started so that we can take that truck traffic off as well as uh, the environmental benefits that it has and Tim has put his finger on, on that as well that's why I want to promote pa high-speed passenger rail as well as freight rail. Now the problem with I-81 is not so much a problem of congestion as, as, as it is enforcement of the laws. The, the, the proposals out there to widen the I-81 are incredibly costly. Things we'll never be able to afford. We've got to, in my, from my perspective, have intermodal facilities on both ends of I-81, which we're in the process of developing for the southern part of 81, mm -hmm. that corridor, and, and develop basically a rail line that, that will can, can move some of the freight from the truck, from the, the highway to the, um, to the rail system. Double stacking, that is the future, I believe, of getting cars and trucks off the road through high-speed rail and using our rail lines for more passenger and most importantly, for our freight that we are now on the roads. How many times have we been on the roads? In 81, I've called for trucks should only be in the right-hand lane on 81. Mm -hmm. How many times have we been stuck, Leon, behind two trucks and you're trying to get the vacation, exactly. you're trying to do something? I say trucks only in the right-hand lane. The question is how much are you gonna raise our taxes? Don't intend to raise taxes. Don't, I, I, I do not intend to raise taxes. I've never taken a no tax pledge because I think it's irresponsible, but it's, it's not, my, not my intent to raise taxes. I don't want to raise anyone's taxes. I want the focus to be on growing our economy, create new economic revenue. Uh, we're 27th in the country. We're about average on individual taxes. We're 36 out of 50 states on business tax, which is low. Uh, I want to climb it to bring more business in and help the small businesses here. I'm not proposing any tax increases. Um, I, and the caveat there, and I'll, let's be honest, I'll, I'll, this is leadership, we need to invest in transportation. We, and we must do it in a way that does not, that's fair and equitable to Virginians. And that means not just taxing Virginians. I would not use an income tax, for example, because that's only Virginians. But somehow, we have to get everybody together to say, come on, transportation is an economic necessity for Virginians. Our next candidate profile is that of State Senator Cree Deeds. This Bath County resident has had a lot of time to learn about Virginia politics. Suzanne Kennedy has his story. Good to see you. Okay, well. If Cree Deeds is the underdog in Virginia's gubernatorial race, you certainly can't tell by the way he's campaigning. The 18-year member of Virginia's General Assembly doesn't miss an opportunity these days to tell people why he wants to be Virginia's top political leader. I'm running for governor because I want to create opportunity and prosperity and hope in every corner of Virginia. Deeds is the son of civil servants, his father a police officer, his mother a mail carrier. He grew up in rural Bath County where he first served as its top prosecutor. The moderate Democrat has been in Virginia's General Assembly since 1992. He is, wants nothing but what's good for Virginia. Fellow state senator Mary Margaret Whipple says Deeds has the best sense of the Democratic candidates of what's best for all parts of the state. 
He wants a unified Virginia, but he mostly wants a Virginia that has a wonderful educational system that grows our workforce because that's what will bring industry and jobs and, and job creation to Virginia. Deeds' candidacy got a shot in the arm in late May when the Washington Post endorsed the 51-year-old. The Post saying Deeds is the best candidate for Northern Virginia, likening him to Governors Mark Warner and Tim Kaine. We thought he got the issues best, particularly for Northern Virginia, and had the capability and the conviction to actually get something done in the next couple of years. The Democrat most qualified to be our next governor, Cree Deeds. Deeds's war chest isn't as significant as his two opponents, but campaign manager Joe Abbey says the candidate is trying not to let that detract from his efforts to win statewide office. He's not in this for political glory. He really wants to serve, and I think that is his biggest motivational factor. Cree Deeds is pro-choice, supports gun rights, but is tough on punishment for criminals and supports the death penalty. Despite being from rural Virginia, supporters say he has a keen sense of the needs of Northern Virginia. Our transportation is a huge issue up here, and uh, he has consistently voted without taking polls, without, you know, what would be popular and what would not, to raise the rest necessary revenue uh, in order to get transportation moving again and a strong pro-business approach. Even though he may come from a very rural part of the state, he understands the importance of business uh, and what it means to Virginia's bottom line. The only election Cree Deeds has ever lost was the 2005 Virginia Attorney General's race against Republican Bob McDonald. He lost by less than 325 points. If Deeds is successful next week, he is likely to face his political nemesis in November's gubernatorial election. In Fairfax County, Suzanne Kennedy, Battleground, Virginia. Politico's John Harris and I had a chance to sit down with Senator Cree Deeds, and we talked about his goal of moving from the state capitol to the governor's mansion. Let's start then with the number one issue on the minds of many voters in Virginia, transportation. It is a tough issue, particularly here in Northern Virginia. What do you plan to do about it? What is gonna be your number one priority to address the transportation issues in the state, and how do you plan to pay for it? My plan will have three broad aspects. Number one, it will be long-term in scope. It will answer the ultimate question, what do we want this place to look like in 50 to 100 years? What modes of transportation are relevant to our lives? Number two, it will be statewide in perspective because you will never develop the consensus you need to continue to pit one part of Virginia against another. These regional authorities, I guess, were necessary ideas because it was the only way we were going to move forward. But frankly, we've got to all move, move forward together. And the third aspect of it, it will we'll have, um, it'll be creative in nature. I think there are short-term things we can do that aren't going to cost a lot of money to reduce congestion. Now, paying for it is, is, a, is a good question. You know, I've not been afraid during my term in the legislature. I've been in the legislature 18 years. I've taken chances. I've, I've been willing to take stands. And I'm willing to be a governor who takes a chance from time to time. I'm not running for dictator. I'm running for governor. A governor develops consensus, brings together Democrats and Republicans, brings together from people from all parts of Virginia to create solutions, and that's what I intend to am do. I, am I hearing you say that you would be willing to raise taxes to pay for your transportation plan? What you're willing, hearing me say is that I'm willing to work together with people of all ilk, all kinds of people, to develop consensus around the transportation solutions. We're going to, and it's going to take, it's going to take sacrifice on the part of a lot of people. It's going to take, it's going to require us to work together. But we, it, from my standpoint, economic activity, the economic growth we have in Virginia is dependent on our ability to find a transportation solution. You know, the average Northern Virginian spends 150 hours in traffic more than anybody else in the state. The, the greatest asset, economic asset we have in Virginia is the Port of Virginia, responsible for the creation of 130,000 jobs from all corners of Virginia. But the port has never de been developed as it, pro as it should be mm -hmm. because we've not invested in transportation infrastructure to support that development. Senator, the best way to get consensus would be to get a mandate from voters uh, this fall and yet uh, neither you nor any of the Democrats who've come here uh, for these interviews have been specific about the funding source. Why the vagueness? Well, I, it's, I'm not being vague, I don't think, and I, I, I would um, challenge you to find a, a past instance where a governor has offered specifics about uh, transportation funding um, from, and been successful. From my perspective, it's a matter of developing consensus around whatever ideas work. An issue that came up in 2007, I believe it was, when the Constitution in, the, in Virginia was amended to ban gay marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you come down on it? Brian Moran is the, is the one candidate, I believe, who has come out and stated his position on it. Where do you stand? Well, 
marriage to me is between one between a man and a woman. But I, I, I in 2000, it came up in 2006. Actually, I voted for the, voted to put it on the ballot in 2006. Mm -hmm. I voted against it in the fall of 2006. I spoke out against it on the radio and radio call-in shows in Harrisonburg, and I spoke out against it on WAMU. Um, I, everybody in my household voted against that amendment. I support equal rights among for all people in, in Virginia, um, and I'll, I'll continue to support those. You have stated in the past that you would not be uh, in favor of bringing detainees from Guantanamo Bay into Virginia, but I'm wondering if President Obama were to call you as governor personally, would you then change your mind? What would you What would you say to him? Uh, well, and, and President Obama, I, I supported for the nomination. I supported last fall. I, I, he's a He's a good, he's a, he's a visionary, I think, a once-in-a-lifetime leader. But on, on this this issue, we just disagree. Fourteen percent of the detainees, once released, are shown to um, recommit themselves to ter terrorist activities. I'm, I'm just not convinced that we can assure the people of Virginia that we can keep keep them safe with the detainees brought to Virginia. I, 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 I will be open if he wants to make the case that this is the place. I, I'd certainly be open to any, any conversation, and, 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 and I'll be open to persuasion. But I, I start off with a pretty high threshold on this issue. I'm just not convinced that we can assure the people of Virginia that, that, that they can be kept safe if we bring the detainees here. Sure. Senator, you've got two candidates uh, who understand Northern Virginia because they're from here. Right. You're not from here. That's right. How, and yet this is uh, by far the biggest bulk of voters uh, in the Commonwealth here in the Washington suburbs. Uh, tell us how you're planning to connect with these voters. That, that, that's an interesting question. You know, we are a Commonwealth. There's no legal distinction between a state and a Commonwealth, but that's a wonderful metaphor for the notion that we're all in this together. And the Washington Post a few weeks back endorsed me. They endorsed me over two candidates from Northern Virginia, and they said I was not only the best candidate, I was going to be the best governor for Northern Virginia and the best governor to take Virginia. Virginia Ford in the tradition of Mark Warner and Tim Kaine because I understand that you have to develop consensus among people from all walks of life from all parts of Virginia. Now you had a chance to beat uh, right. Bob McDonald. He uh, outpaced you by just a few votes but uh, more than two to one on fundraising. So like, how can you make the case or make the case to Democrats well, now that you're prepared to win which is, is what they care about? I'm the only Democrat in this race that's ever run for statewide office. I ran against Bob McDonald four years ago. He outspent me two to one. The demographics were in his favor. He was raised in Fairfax, lived in Virginia Beach, the two biggest places in the state. The only place in the world I've got to call home is Bath County. I live four miles upstream from a house my ancestors built in the 1740s. You know, I wouldn't be from any place else, but it's, it's less than 5,000 people live in Bath County. He outspent me two to one. The demographics were against me. It was more Republican state in 2005 than it is now. The attorney, I will not be outspent to one when I'm the nominee, the Democratic nominee for governor. I, don't know, I know how to beat Bob McDonald. In current polls, each Democratic candidate trails Bob McDonald by at least 3% or more. Yeah. Which of you will be the strongest candidate against McDonald, and what makes you the strongest? Yeah, I've created jobs. I know what to do it. I got a business plan. I haven't been part of these partisan battles down okay. in Richmond, which Bob McDonald, and he would bring an ideological agenda, which is not where Virginians All right. are. I've stood up to Bob time and time again and, and beaten him. In 2004, we passed the largest investment in public education over Bob McDonald's objection. Uh, I, I will beat Bob in the fall. Uh, we have to have a big turnout in Northern Virginia. You saw that in Jim Webb's race. Jim Webb came out of Northern Virginia with about a 64,000 vote uh, plurality, and he won by 9,000 votes over George Allen. You must come out of Northern Virginia strong, and that's something that I bring to the table in this race. I've run against McDonald once before. Um, I, I've proven I could beat him. The Lynchburg paper says I'm the only candidate, only Democratic candidate that can put together the coalition of Democrats, Independents, and Republicans that got Mark Warner elected governor. The Virginia pilot says I'm the I'm the candidate in, who's moderate in the mold of Mark Warner and Tim Kaine. Larry Sabato says my nomination, because I've got broadest appeal, my nomination would make um, Bob McDonald's election virtually impossible. Um, I think I'm the strongest candidate. What will you do to encourage Virginia and the power industry to move to a smart grid and green economy? We must incentivize our consumers to use less energy. How would that work? And, well, because you, you, have a, you have smart metering in your home. So I know when my the the energy I am using is cheapest and cleanest when it is coming from wind or solar as opposed to coal or, or oil. So when I do my dishes or, or, you know, uh, or, or clothes, I know when it is the cheapest and the cleanest. The technology exists. That's where we, our investment should be. That's where our focus and attention be is energy conservation as well as developing renewable sources of energy like wind and solar. I will require Dominion to do that. I'm the only one out there with, the, with, with a plan to do that. What I 
I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to incentivize um, alternative energy manufacturers to come to Virginia through grant programs and tax credits. I'm going to create an energy-based research triangle, essentially using un untapped capacity of research institutions to develop the next wave of um, smart technologies, of green technologies. And I'm going to invest in several um, biomass plants that I think will, will revolutionize um, the revolutionize rural economic development, frankly, through the use of um, poultry litter, switchgrass, and algae. Um, I'm also going to incentivize the growth of this, the wind industry because I, th I think we have a huge potential to have wind farms off the coast of, coast of Virginia Beach and in southwest Virginia. We can be a, a worldwide leader in alternative energy. I talk about wind farms, I talk about chicken waste a lot, but these are serious issues because the chicken waste leaches into the watershed into the Chesapeake. We could convert 100% of that into energy. 40 megawatts of power we could create just from chicken waste. So alternative energies is something I have focused on my whole life. This is very important for us. Agriculture waste, we need to be moving to alternative sources, wind, we're one of uh, 15 states that offer no tax incentives to put solar panels on your roof. Efficiencies. So if I'm governor, I would like to see us a smart grid state. Every home ought to have a smart meter on it. Roughly 40% of the seats in Virginia universities are awarded to out-of-state right. students who pay higher tuitions. Right. Now, what will you do to give qualified Virginia students right. an equal chance of being seated in a taxpayer subsidized institution? We are not investing as much money as a state in higher education as we once did. Mm -hmm. We use once invested, just eight or nine years ago, we invested better than $10,000 in general fund money per student to in our four-year system. Now we're less than $7,000 per student. The result of that has been tuitions increased around 80% over the last eight years. We've got significant work to do to make higher education more affordable and more accessible because, frankly, higher education is the key to economic growth. Um, so I've laid out several plans. Number but two, two big ones. A four-year plan to make higher education more affordable. The goal is that in four years' time, a Virginia, a Virginia resident who plays by the rules, who can be admitted to four year, a four-year school, is not going to be denied access to that school because of money. And the second, the second goal is probably as ambitious, and I'm confident we can, we can hit the affordability numbers. Mm -hmm. I've got plans to, to um, guarantee loans and, and put more money in need-based financial aid. I've got plans to set up a re revenue or, or a tuition stabilization fund, essentially along the model of the rainy day fund, but we've got a more ambitious plan that's over 10 years, and I'll only be governor for four, over 10 years to create 70,000 more degree positions in the two and four year system, and that will enable us to create more access for higher education. I'm not for putting caps on in-state versus out-of-state. You know as well as I do, we need those out-of-state students because the amount of tuition they're paying, they're paying much higher tuition, mm -hmm. which helps uh, financially the institutions. My simple answer is, let's get more slots. You know, I, w I just had lunch with the uh, president of George Mason the other day. He said, Terry, I could fill up 6,000 more seats if you'd give me the authority to do it. I met with all the college presidents the other day who support me on a lot of my initiatives about privatizing and commercializing the patents in universities, who support me 100% on this. With those projects that I talk about in uh, chapter four of my business plan, I think we just have to go out and get more slots. I couldn't agree with you more. This is an affordability issue as well as an accessibility issue. Uh, we must have a balance in Virginia. We have wonderful colleges and universities, and they are wonderful and nationally recognized because we do bring in some very talented students from across the country and Nation, internationally from would other you, countries. Would, would you limit but the number must, of out-of-state students? Well, we must, it, 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 you know, I'd like to work with our colleges and universities for, first in a more collaborative fashion. Let's cooperate. But, hey, you know, you have a 3.5, you've been in the band or played sports, all these extracurricular activities, shown leadership qualities in high school, and you can't get into a, one of our colleges. That's just not right. Hi, my name is James, and I'm from Arlington, Virginia. My question is this. It's four years into the future. Your gubernatorial term is almost up. What is the one thing that you most want to be remembered for? And please don't do that politician thing where you say one thing and then you list a bunch of other things because you want to get them all in there. No, one thing please, thank you. Job creator in chief. Simple as that. Simple, create jobs. With jobs I get to do everything else I want to do. Without jobs, they're raising your taxes or cutting your budget more. And I don't want to do that. You do have four years and you have to hit the ground running. I have that experience and the ability because I, I truly believe that what distinguishes me. On day one, I have the relationships with the members of the House of Delegates who have been the impediment to a lot of progress. I want to get Virginia moving. 
there's more than one thing. There's bipartisan redistricting, there's two-term governor, there's a transportation proposal, there's an, uh, uh, a transportation you're solution. You're doing it. I you're know, doing it. I know. You're, He's you're right. putting out the list. That's a fall. One thing, uh, I guess, well, geez, uh, it's tough to, between trans, but they're all interconnected because if we get a transportation system that's smart with respect to rail and transit, it will also help our environment. Because I, I really want to set Virginia on the path to a clean energy system, which will create thousands of new jobs and protect our environment, you know, in the Chesapeake Bay. So they're all, they're interconnected. I, I appreciate the question. The one thing, I want to be the governor that brings opportunity and prosperity and hope to every corner of Virginia. Now. Contrary to what James says, I, I know how I can do, get that done. I can get that done by creating more educational opportunities for people all over Virginia and by developing a transportation system that becomes a model for the rest of the world, by developing an energy technology-based economy. I mean, um, so I fit it all in. I'm sorry, James. After spending more than 10 years in Virginia's General Assembly, Brian Moran resigned to focus on trying to become governor. So was that a smart move? As Gail Pennybacher shows us, Moran's supporters say absolutely. Hi, Brian, how are you? Hi, nice to see you. If handshakes turn to votes, Brian Moran would be well on his way to the general election for Virginia governor. Well, we're trying to communicate as much as possible. As the youngest of seven children in a working class Boston household, Moran was taught to be humble but learned early to be assertive. Brian is the type of person that grew up the hard way, and he understands what it's like to struggle. Law school brought him to Northern Virginia. He worked his way through. Sights set on a career in public service like his older brother, Virginia Congressman Jim Moran. Mame Riley is Brian Moran's campaign chair. He's the type of person I think that's really spent his life working for those who are in the shadows of society. Um, because if it's not an even playing field, then it's not working. After years as a prosecutor here in Arlington County enforcing the laws, Brian Moran ran for the House of Delegates and won so he could take a hand in making the law. Over 13 years representing the Alexandria area in the General Assembly, <laughs> Moran earned a reputation as a bipartisan playmaker. And the thing that I think separates Brian from the other candidates in the race is that he knows how to reach across the party the aisle, the, the party lines, and work with, with Republicans. Eventually, as leader of the House Democratic Caucus, Moran worked to transform the political landscape of Virginia for the 2008 presidential election. That's why he's won the endorsement of the majority of Virginia's mayors, including Robin Gardner of Falls Church. He is a consensus builder, and he's proven that again and again uh, in the House of Delegates. Fairfax County Board of Supervisors member Kathy Hudgens says Moran made big strides for all of Northern Virginia in energy, education, and the economy specifically the persistent push for Dulles Rail. The willingness to speak out for us, to make sure that it could happen, but also to gunder the support of others from around the Commonwealth. Moran is pro-choice, supports a legal track for immigrants towards citizenship. He wants gun law reform and supports civil unions that would require changing Virginia law banning same-sex contracts. As governor, I will not rest until we repeal the Marshall Newman Amendment. But that Marshall Newman Amendment was hurtful and hateful, and we didn't need to write discrimination into Thomas Jefferson's sacred document, the Constitution of Virginia. Now, I'm a volunteer with Democrat Brian Moran's campaign for governor. Time is running out in Moran's quest to become governor. If he is elected, it would be something of a history-making feat. It's been almost 60 years since Virginians voted in a governor directly from the General Assembly. Well, I'm Brian Moran, running for governor, and the election's June 9th. I've loved your vote. Until then, Moran will keep shaking hands to earn those votes. In Arlington, Gail Pennybacher, Battleground, Virginia. Brian Moran has his own plan for fixing some of Virginia's problems, like transportation. Politico's John Harris and I sat down with Moran to find out why he thinks his plans will work. Transportation, yes. that is the number one issue for many people in, in the, the Commonwealth. What is your number one priority when it comes to fixing the transportation problems in Virginia, and how do you plan to pay for it? Well, you need to promote rail and transit. And I, and I say it, it's a comprehensive, multimodal approach. I mean, to pedestrians, I've, I've championed legislation to try to make pedestrian-friendly roadways, bicyclists, and then, of course, rail and transit, high-speed rail from Washington, D.C. to Richmond, expansion of Virginia Railway Express, that takes a whole lane of vehicle traffic off 95 for our commuters south of here in Stafford and Fredericksburg and Prince William. So you, you expand VRE options. Um, 
And of course, we have a wonderful rail finally to Dulles, and I congratulate all those who were who were instrumental in making that a reality. You got a plan for that, uh, those things you want, but how do you pay? How do you pay sure. for them? You well, raise taxes, or are you going to make cuts? Well, I was the only one who stood with Governor Kane at his press conference last June when he had the special session. I stood with Governor Kane then when he needed assistance. I stood with him. I co-patroned his legislation that would have raised revenue from a multi uh, source of revenue. Essentially, what we need is approximately a billion dollars per year to invest in our transportation infrastructure. And it has to be statewide. It should be sufficient, about a billion dollars, which would generate 35,000 jobs just in construction. It would also ensure our future economic viability. So it's a smart investment in our future. It will pay dividends in the long run. where's the billion come from? Are you raising taxes no, to get it? Any number of sources. What we're going to have to do is bring all those in, uh, involved to the table, and I know exactly who it's going to be. Having that 13 years of legislative experience, I know exactly who uh, will work with me to come up with a transportation deal. You called for an increase in the sales tax. Uh, uh, Terry McAuliffe says that's not a good idea, particularly in a down economy. Explain that difference. Well, we have to come up with uh, approximately a billion dollars per year. Last year, we had a special session. Governor Kane called it. What I did is I floated an idea, trying to reach, you know, trying to take leadership. And this is a defining moment in this race. I have a 13-year record in the legislature of being a leader. I've been a Democratic leader, traveling this Commonwealth, recruiting candidates, supporting candidates who will be pro-education, pro-environmentally uh, conscious, as well as pro-economic uh, development. And transportation is an economic development issue. Southside Virginia, expanding Route 58, I-81, the Shenandoah Valley. I mean, this is a statewide issue. The 2007, I believe it was, constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage in Virginia. Uh, well, it went well beyond that, Leon. That's the issue. You know, it banned civil unions and it banned contracts between same-sex individuals. Hospital visitations, purchasing property together, domestic partner benefits. We can't even have a reasonable conversation with respect to those issues because of the Marshall Newman Amendment. I opposed it then. One of my opponents voted for that ten times over the course of two, year, two years. The other opponent says he won't have time to repeal it. I'm the only candidate who says we should repeal that because we can't. We should repeal it. I was opposed to it from the very beginning. Uh, we should not have discriminatory language in our Virginia Constitution. I opposed it then. I continue to oppose it to this day. And we, as I say, we can't even have a conversation with respect to contracts between same-sex individuals, with respect to hospital visitations, and other things that the majority of Virginians believe should be afforded to our gay and lesbian Virginians. Mr. McAuliffe said he's going to spend his political capital on transportation, economic growth, and doesn't expect to, to be spending political capital on this issue. You think it's important enough that you are willing to, to spend political well, capital on. Tell us why. John, uh, because equality is something you fight for. You know, that's why I'm in public service. Guantanamo Bay and the detainees there. That is one of the thorniest national security and international relations issues that yeah. the country is facing right now. Uh, we know that you have said that uh, you've, stated, you've stated that you would, would not want the detainees to be brought to Virginia. If President Obama were to call you, if he were to personally ask you to, to take detainees into Virginia, what would you say? Well, I'll wait for him to call me. My cell phone number is 703-901-7207. Well, let's just say he picked up the phone and he's dialing right now. I can't what believe I just gave my cell phone yeah. number. <laughs> yeah, really? in Virginia. But I, I want to listen to people. I, I, you know, I'm a great listener. I was a bartender for years and put myself through college. So I've become a very good listener, and that's why I'm a good consensus builder. As governor of Virginia, my first priority is to the citizens of Virginia, and that's public safety. I must ensure the public safety of all Virginians. And if those trials present uh, a threat to the public safety of any of my fellow Virginians, that is my top priority. And so I would, I would not welcome those trials to occur in Virginia. The Washington Post editorial, sometimes significant in Northern Virginia in these kind of races, uh, they did not endorse you, they endorsed the Cree deeds. Uh, but they did have a line in there you should uh, have a chance to respond to uh, about you. Said it's hard to point to an instance when you made the politically difficult choice. What's wow. your response to that editorial? Uh, well, you already highlighted the fact that I came out last year for, you know, proposed a sales tax to address transportation. So, you know, the, the um, I've made a lot of hard, hard choices. And in this campaign, look at the differences in this campaign. I'm the only one who opposes a coal-fired power plant in the, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. I'm the only one who opposes offshore drilling. I'm the only one for the repeal of the Marshall Newman Amendment. I'm the only one with a plan to enroll every single Virginia child in health care. No, there are a lot of differences between uh, myself and my opponents.
So you have now heard where the three Democratic candidates stand on transportation, college cost, and other important issues. So now all that's left is for Virginians to decide which of these three men will face Republican Bob McDonald in the general election. McDonald has an extensive history in Virginia. He grew up in Fairfax County, served in the military, the House of Delegates, and as Virginia's Attorney General. McDonald, along with the entire state, will be watching closely to see who wins the Democratic primary on June 9th. And then the race will be on towards November 3rd, when a new Virginia governor will be chosen. Thanks for watching our Battleground Virginia special. I'm Leon Harris. Good night.